Hey guys, I'm Greg Devlin with the Neon Tiki Tribe, and I want to take you back and give you the backstory of how the Neon Tiki Tribe got started. So let me go all the way back to when I was a kid in Cincinnati, Ohio with my girlfriend. Here I am at 13 years old with my 12 year old girlfriend, Annette Buchanan. We dated four years. I married her at 16 and I had just turned 18. I joined the Air Force. Her and I went to Little Rock Air Force Base in Arkansas, and I became an explosion survivor of the largest nuclear missile the United States ever owned called a Titan II missile. Let me tell you this amazing story. This explosion happened on September 19, 1980 in Damascus, Arkansas at a Titan II missile silo complex. It was routine maintenance that was being done by the first shift technicians who were basically going to take an eight pound socket connected to a three foot ratchet on the side of the missile there at approximately 70 feet up on the missile, uh, that cap right there. All they do is connect the socket and the ratchet, break the cap loose and basically connect this line so they could put pressure on top of the tank. It was a simple procedure. When the socket fell off the ratchet on that platform they were standing on right there here, the bottom there and that's what it looks like up close against the missile the socket got past the black rubber piece that's supposed to keep it from falling and it dropped 70 feet 70 feet to the very bottom you see a silver ring down here and that's a thrust mount so it bounced off the thrust mount punctures the fuel tank and it starts leaking 12,000 gallons of hydrazine which is a really hazardous fuel so my partner and I, this is me being suited up here in a file photo, and they sent us in, they wanted us to see, they wanted us to get down inside this complex here, where you see the silo door in the center, and you see the, uh, uh, this is called the uh, uh, portal entry here. But they sent us from this gate, they had us cut the fence uh, with bolt cutters, go over to this portal entry here, go down, 15 steps and break through a steel frame portal door, go 35 more feet down uh, to a 6,000 pound blast lock door. Then we had to hook a hydraulic pump to the door and start pumping the pin open. Remember, there were no launch officers on site because they had evacuated due to the hazardous situation. So they sent my partner and I in and they wanted us to get to this panel it's a vapor detector panel, and it tells you how bad it is out in the silo, which is approximately 120 feet out past another 6,000 pound blast lock door, uh, which had been leaking fuel for almost seven hours. After we started to get low on air, they sent us back gate right there at the fence. So we're standing right here at the fence and waiting on the other two guys. They went down, they were able to reach the panel. When they got there, all the, uh, panels all the uh, gauges were pegged to the right there all the lights were lit up uh, basically it was about to explode it was explosion level so they tell them to come back as they come topside finally reach topside as soon as they got right back here at this portal the thing exploded remember i'm standing right here at this uh this gate uh there's actually a pickup truck here i slide 60 feet on my back I want to show you what happened to the silo door. So that's the silo door missing. Notice the steel rebar over here. There's a massive chunk of concrete on this side that came towards me. The silo door itself went away from me. I'll show you where the door went. So here's the silo door. This is 743 tons. It's held down by great big hydraulic pins. It blew at 600 feet off the complex away from us but the concrete this is the concrete right there if you notice the asphalt road right here uh, i slid 60 feet on my back the concrete that was sitting and where that rebar was at over there come came towards me so i don't have any idea about this now um, this is this is another view of the concrete and in this picture the asphalt road is this way and the, and the gate is over to this direction to the left of the photo so I slide on my back and I wind up approximately here. I don't know if you believe in guardian angels or not, but as soon as I came to a stop, 
I heard two high-pitched female voice screams yelling, run, twice in my left ear, about two inches from my ear. It scared me so bad, I rolled over to look to see who the woman was that was screaming at me. When I looked, it was pitch black, three o'clock in the morning, there was no one there. Well, that scared me worse than anything. So I jumped up, I took off running, and I got five steps, and I wind up about here when this concrete lands right behind me as I'm running. Now, it felt like an earthquake. I had no clue what it was. I didn't care. I wasn't turning around. Look, I was trying to get away from it. But if you notice the steel rebar hanging out of that concrete, um, that's what hit me in the back of the ankle. It shattered my ankle, uh, severed my Achilles tendon. I had burns on my face, neck, back, both hands, a broken eardrum. Uh, they did skin grafts on my uh, left hand and two pins in my ankle. And then, uh, um, like I said, two thirds of the Achilles tendon was Every eight hours they came in to scrub the dead skin off of me. Uh, you can see the massive chunks of concrete. That's a six foot guy standing there uh, next to that concrete. That concrete used to be underground. My, uh, my partner who went in with me that day was Rex Huckel. Uh, he wound up with a shattered kneecap and burns on his hands. So one guy died, 23 people were injured. A friend of mine, Dave Livingston died. This is, to give you an idea, this is kind of the back corner of his helmet. If you look over here, this is the visor, what's left of the visor. It broke out the visor on that side, and a lot of concrete went through that suit. If you look over here at this suit, you can see the boots and the uh, boots over here and the cuffs. Uh, notice the big puncture holes here and here. Those are massive chunks of concrete that went through that suit, uh, just like that helmet. Um, Dave Livingston died 12 hours later. Um, after the missile explosion in a hospital. Now his partner was a guy named Jeff Kennedy. Jeff was six foot four, 250 pounds. Dave was five foot seven, 150 pounds. But um, anyway, Jeff Kennedy, you can see all of this. Jeff left the service as a 100% disabled veteran. I left the service as a 50% disabled veteran. And I've since become a 100% because I've had 13 spine surgeries. But anyway, they gave the Airman's Medal, which is the highest medal given during times of peace. It was a Cold War time frame. Uh, to eight people, here's four of them. This is Jeff Kennedy, six foot four, two fifty. Rex Huckel, who went in with me, um, and Jeff went in with David Livingston, the guy who passed. This is Silas Spann, um, who was out there with us. This is me over here. Uh, this is the actual uh, ceremony when they were giving the medals out, and there's a news clipping of it. Uh, they wrote a book called Command and Control uh, by Eric Schlosser. This is a kind of a, a pre-sale copy there. He gave that to me before it came out, but that came out in 2013. And then that later became a movie uh, called Command and Control that's on Netflix or uh, PBS, the American Experience TV series. You can see it on that. Um, Florida Today did a story, close call. They did that in January of 2016. So an explosion alters my life. I had planned on a 20 plus year career in the Air Force, but afterward I knew I couldn't stay. So, where else do they use fuels that the Titan II missile uses? Kennedy Space Center, the shuttle program. Keep in mind, this is in 1981, just when the shuttle program was starting. I was there from the second launch on. So, after the missile explosion um, ended my career in the Air Force, uh, I got out and um, I went to work at the Kennedy Space Center. My wife and I moved to uh, Titusville, Florida. And uh, I was so lucky to be able to work with the shuttle program. Uh, it was called Life Support. We were the first vehicle that would meet the shuttle when it would land in a uh, NASA SCAPE van. SCAPE is the name of the suit, uh, self-contained atmospheric pressure ensemble that, the, that we would wear, that the guys would wear. That was SCAPE base. That was always at the back of the shuttle when it would land. Here's a, a cool photo with the astronauts uh, underneath the shuttle uh, on one of the missions. And this is called the mate demate. That's when it lands in California, they have to pick it up, slide it on a underneath the 747 and then fly it back to Florida. And then this was in the cockpit of the shuttle. So everything's going great with the shuttle program. I've been there five years. I love my job. And the Challenger shuttle explodes on takeoff. My wife and I were actually watching the launch. It was so heartbreaking. Nine months later, on the exact same day, September 19th, 1980, was the missile explosion. September 19th, 1986 is the day I was laid off 
from the Kennedy Space Center. And it would be about three years, almost three years before they would call us back. I had to do something. I had to feed my family. So let me show you what I did. I started a tree transplant company called Tremendous Trees. So I started a tree moving business called Tremendous Trees, spelled with double E's there, T-R-E-E-M-E-N-D-O-U-S. Tremendous Trees. And we had great big space. Here was a Florida Today news article that was done on us moving a great big oak tree there. We had multiple trucks. We had 44-inch Vermeer spade, a 78-inch Big John. We also had a crane truck that we used to stack multiple palm trees on the back end and then plant them in the ground uh, in groups. Here's a great big Canary Island date palm being moved. There's kind of a fun photo I took with my daughters. That was just a photo opportunity. We were doing maintenance on a truck and we got a great picture there. Here, me, here I am moving an oak tree. Here's some maintenance work. There's some maintenance work here. I'm greasing all the rollers on the blades. When I first got that truck, one of our little spades working. And here's a fun photo, which was just the truck's four car zero. We were never in an accident. That was all just for fun. We did a lot of the Christmas parades and a lot of community stuff here with the truck. We also had a designated driver program. If you couldn't get home, we'd come pick your car up. And the uh, only problem is we didn't know how well they drove afterward, but obviously this is just a joke. My buddy, Mike McLeod, wanted that Volkswagen hauled off to the dump, so he wondered if my truck would pick it up, and we tried it out. We did work on the Veterans Memorial Park here in Titusville, Florida. We put the monuments in. We put a lot of trees in. We put the landscaping in. That was a great job. But every once in a while, I'd get a dead tree, and all my trees were guaranteed for a year. One year guarantee. If anything dies, I'll give you a new tree. And for one time, I had to bring a dead one. I was going to take it to the dump, but it was, it was a really fat trunk cabbage palm, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to use this tree as a, uh, I'm going to carve a tiki. I want to take my chainsaw and see if I could carve a face in it. That's the face I carved in it. Those are three of my four daughters. Jacqueline's the oldest. Kelly's the second in line. And Rachel was third. We had a baby born after that, Kara. It was a few years later than that. But So that's uh, that was the tremendous trees business was going really well in life. And now let me tell you what happened. So one day I'm running late for work. We're, we got a big job we're doing. I'm in a big hurry. I'm scrambling, running. I'm getting all my equipment and I'm looking for my sunglasses. Where are my glasses at, man? Where are my glasses at? So I grab a pair, which I thought were mine. They were my brother-in-law, Dan Ryan's. I pick them up, put them on my face. I start to go out the door. And one of the guys that works with me says, Greg, why do you have two pairs of sunglasses on? I said, what? He said, you got two pairs of glasses. I said, oh my gosh. I said, what the heck am I doing, man? So, but it was just like a bell went off in my head. I went, whoa, that's the idea I need. He said, what? I said, that's the idea I need. I said, we're going to sell a concept called backups, a spare pair. Kids are going to be wearing multiple pairs of sunglasses, one on their face, one in their hair, maybe hang the cords around their neck, have two or three pairs, different neon colors, green, yellow, purple, orange, so we had six colors and we put this concept together, backups a spare pair with the logo, trademarked the logo, and we start to run with this concept. Let me show you that. Backups, a spare pair, the latest craze in shades. Do you dare wear a spare? This was an ad that ran in Teen Beat magazine. That was that lady there is a friend of mine's lovely wife. She was a model for us. You can see uh, four pairs of sunglasses there. We actually had six different colors. We had t-shirts, we had posters, we had bumper stickers. We did live shows. Uh, we actually did fashion shows with them. And we did one at Surf Cincinnati. That was with McAlpin's uh, fashion store. Here's a photo of my lovely wife and I. I have three pairs of glasses on right there. And she's staying a little more conservative, trying to figure out if she's married to a crazy man or not. Now, remember that tiki that I carved in the tree business, right? That's sitting on the side of my house. I said, man, I said, I think I'm going to pull that thing out by the street. And I'm going to put a couple pairs of sunglasses on it. I'm going to paint it bright neon colors. And we're going to see if we can promote the sunglasses out there. Well, what happened was almost magical. I had 
cars almost crashing in front of the house. They would, someone would be taking a photo and somebody behind them not paying attention would almost hit them in the rear. I had two college photography classes that stopped by and one was, they wanted to take a photo at night, one wanted to take a photo in the daytime. I had newspapers coming by to do a story on that neon tiki. And I thought, what the heck is it about that daggone neon tiki, man? Just then a bell went off in my head. I went, whoa, wait a second. This is a country that created a teenage mutant ninja turtle that came to life in a New York City sewer. I said, I'll bet I can create a new superhero series called the Neon Tiki Tribe. Let me show them to you. Hey, gang, I had to take my jacket off. This story's about to heat up. Check it out. The first tiki we created was Zeke Tiki. Then we kept on going. We created Moa the Great. The largest of the Neon Tiki tribe, by the way, that Tiki was 16 and a half foot tall, 5,000 pounds. That was Dar Tiki, the third Tiki, and the last one was Tia. I tried to make that thing look cute, but for the life of me, I couldn't make that look like a girl. The plan was to create a brand new superhero series for kids. My sister, my loving sister, Debbie Ryan, created the first set of handmade Neon Tiki tribe toys. We wrote a book called Think Neon that brought the Neon Tikis to life near the Kennedy Space Center in the Enchanted Forest. And we created an eight-foot set of costume neon tikis. Then from those original toys my sister made, we had partnered kind of with Walmart. They got us the first toys started. We had to notice the backup sunglasses on there. Zeke over there to the left, Dar there, and the green one, the pink one's Tia, and we had Moa the Great. We had t-shirt designs. That was the very first t-shirt we ever did right here. Then we started to write the storylines and they would travel by a neon cyclone and a rainbow. We built an eight foot costume character set. We were visiting Walmart stores. Get a better picture of that. Walmarts, we were at Wendy's. We did children's hospitals. This was Los Angeles Children's Hospital with uh, Kimberly McCullough. Robin on General Hospital, youngest Emmy Award winner ever. I think she won it at seven years old. Uh, we did the White House. We took them out there. Should have seen the park police. We had five different police departments wondering who the heck we were. Here's a great photo with Regis and, and Kathy Lee many years ago. This was at the NATP convention, the television convention that was in New Orleans. I want to say 1995. We had beanie tikis. So the main theme of the Neon Tiki tribe were non-violent action heroes. They had laser powers out of their sunglasses. Green was a vine that could tie somebody up. Blue was a water hose, water cannon to keep, keep them back if they were trying to harm you. Uh, pink would make them change your thinking completely. Pink was a power of love. Purple was the all magical, could almost make anything happen in the series. We wanted to create action and excitement. That was kind of the theme behind the Neon Tiki tribe. When we started this, we figured two or three years, this thing's going to be across the country, a very successful campaign. The world's going to buy into a, a nonviolent action hero. 16 years later, 16 years and $1 million. Much of it from my family. We sold, we liquidated the entire tree business. We had rental properties we sold. We thought this was it. This is the home run. We're going to take this baby around the world. And 16 years later, it ran out of money. We couldn't get an animation contract. We couldn't get a toy deal. And keep in mind, this is back in the early 90s. The internet wasn't anything back then. So long story short, the project goes under. Oh my gosh, was that a crushing blow to me. What am I going to do now? I was four payments behind on my house payment with my wife and four daughters. Four payments behind. I was like crushed, man. Well, luckily, I was able to go back to work at the Kennedy Space Center. And that pays pretty well. Um, you know, it was kind of a crushing defeat to me, but I went back to work at the Kennedy Space Center. My very first paycheck the mortgage company was about to foreclose on my home. I was four payments behind on my, on my payment. And my payment came on Friday. They wanted to foreclose on Thursday. So I, 
I called them and I said, listen, I get paid tomorrow. They said, okay, we'll delay it one day. If you make a double house payment on your home tomorrow and has to be wire transferred, Western Union, you make the double house payment and then a payment and a half for five more months and then pay all the late fees six months later that we will save your home and you can stay in your home. So I went back to work. My wife and I only had one vehicle, one Ford Aerostar van. She would take it in the daytime. I would take it for second shift at the Kennedy Space Center. So I went back to work at the Kennedy Space Center. About a year later, one of the guys who had loaned money to this project in, in the beginning, him and his family, he called me back up. His name was Dave Thompson. He said, Greg, we just have to go back to the drawing board. Something's wrong. So we went back to the drawing board and in our research, we started looking hard. We brought in a new team of writers, illustrators. Um, we started working with parents, started working with teachers, started working with uh, special education teachers, literacy professionals. And we saw that the original tiki's we had, they were lots of colors. So they're kind of hard to distinguish. So when we created the new line of neon tiki's, when you look, when you see them, they're all almost a single color. Like he's almost all blue. He has a, has a little stripe in his hair, but he's all blue. He's all green. Tia's all pink. And Mo the Great, the uh, orange one you can't, that's out of the picture there. He's all, let me bring him over. So he used to have the purple hair. So he's all orange now. So it makes it a little more kid friendly. We also took the glasses off their face because it's hard for kids to know if someone has glasses on, are they angry? Are they happy? Are they, what are their emotions when you can't see their eyes? So we took the glasses off on the new Tiki's. You'll see we, we gave them smiles on their faces and we just made them more kid friendly. So that got better right off the start. Then instead of a nonviolent action hero, we kind of dropped that. We said, we're going to have an educational group of superheroes. So every single story is going to be a real life value to your little boy or little girl. So there's no way I could foresee an explosion in the Air Force, which altered my life and shortened my career in the Air Force. I couldn't foresee an explosion at the Kennedy Space Center altering that career. Who knows when you start a tree transplant business that a couple coincidences are what launched first a line of sunglasses and second, the Neon Tiki Tri project. And even though it failed in the first run, we just couldn't give up on the kids. This isn't about me. This isn't about my family. This is about children, your children. It's about your family. It's about society as a whole. Even from the very beginning with the first Neon Tiki tribe, we wanted something better. I didn't want just an average superhero series. They were nonviolent action heroes. I wanted something better than what was out there. So then you team up with fantastic people and look what happens. So we hope you'll help us spread this message. So as Paul Harvey used to say, now you know the rest of the story. Thanks for hanging in there this long. Need.